We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A month before last year's Scottish elections, the Deputy First Minister promised that basic rate taxpayers would not see their tax bills rise. It was, he said, the right reassurance to give to people who are already finding it challenging to meet and meet. We will give them that reassurance for the remainder of the parliamentary term. Will he stick to that promise, yes or no? Deputy First Minister. As Ruth Davidson will know, the Scottish Government is engaged in a dialogue and discussion with the public in Scotland, which is the right thing to do at this moment, to consider the steps that we should take on taxation. And that debate has been led by the Finance Secretary. The options have been set out, a range of options, including an assessment of the plans of various political parties. And the questions that the Government is engaged in discussing with members of the public is about the correct stance to take on taxation to make sure that we can fund effectively the public services of Scotland to meet the needs of people in our country and to invest in developing the Scottish economy given the significant economic challenges we face arising out of Brexit. So those are the issues that the government will discuss as part of the consultation with members of the public. That is the right approach to take forward and the Finance Secretary will announce the conclusions of that in the budget in December. Ruth Davison. Oh, that was a bit lacklustre. Oh. It sounds to me like the Deputy First Minister isn't prepared to stick to that promise, but let's give him another chance. Again, before the election in 2016, he made another promise. He was asked about what he'd say to local government staff who were worried about their jobs, and he replied, I say to those individuals that the Scottish National Party is determined, determined to protect their incomes, not punish them with a tax rise. So... Before the election, the Deputy First Minister said a tax rise would be a punishment, and now apparently it's a virtue. So can the Deputy First Minister explain why the SNP said one thing to people about taxes when they needed their votes, and another once they had them? Deputy First Minister. Well, I, I don't think Ruth Davidson follows closely what the government says on these questions. <laughs> because... Because what the government says on these questions is that we will act to protect at all times the interests of low-income individuals within our society. That has been what has run through this government's promise. So when, so when the United Kingdom government slashed council tax benefit, this Scottish government came to the rescue. This finan former finance secretary came to the rescue of low-income families within Scotland. When the bedroom tax was applied by the Conservative government, this former finance secretary came to the rescue of low-income households in the Scotland. So I'm absolutely determined to make sure we stand shoulder to shoulder with low-income households in Scotland and take the right decisions to protect their incomes. Ruth Davidson. Officer, the truth is the SNP wheeled out Mr Swinney, honest John, before the election to tell people that their taxes wouldn't go up and as soon as they got back in, those promises turned to dust. But just to be completely fair, let's give the Deputy First Minister one more opportunity. Just a few weeks before the election, he said this. I want to say to teachers and public service workers the length and breadth of the country, I value the sacrifices that they have made and the last thing that I am going to do is put up their taxes. The last thing, it turns out the only thing that you lot are going to do with taxes is put them up. One thing before an election, the exact opposite after. Does this sound to the Deputy First Minister like honest government? Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is engaged in a substantive debate with members of the public about the real choices that are faced when you are in government. When you are trying to address the fact that public expenditure has been slashed by the United Kingdom Government and austerity continues to roll forward year by year, although the Chancellor has an opportunity next week to bring that to a halt. So we're involved in that discussion because we have to take the real hard decisions in government. Ruth Davidson comes to this parliament 
yes, she's raising the issue of tax today, but she doesn't talk about her proposals, which would reduce taxation for some of the richest people in our society, and, and also, and also would remove £140 million from public expenditure within Scotland. And I'll give Parliament an illustration of what £140 million looks like. It looks like going to every single school in the country that is in receipt of pupil equity funding and saying, because of the Tory tax cuts, we are taking that money away from you and we're giving it to the richest in our society. Now, this government is determined to use public expenditure to close the equity gap in Scottish education, to deliver the best future for young people in our country, and we're determined to resist the Tories' attempt to take it away from them. Ruth Davidson. We're all shouting today, but they were shouting something completely different just a year ago. Yeah. Last year, they were shouting, vote for us, and we won't put taxes up. Yeah. All change. But, presiding officer, we on these benches, we're just saddened that the Deputy First Minister has lost his way. Lost his way. Because there was once a time when he and Alex Salmond used to preach the merits of competitive taxation. Yeah. Now Mr Swinney takes his directions from Derek Mackay and Mr Salmond takes his from Mr Putin. Yeah. How the mighty have fallen. But that's the SNP for you. Broken promises, higher taxes and Putin's pals. Isn't it time they apologise to the people they misled? Deputy First Minister. The only sad thing today is the miserable contribution of Ruth Davidson to First Minister's question time. That, that, that is what is sad. Week in, week in, week out, we have this miserable contribution to the debate about the future of Scotland. This government takes the serious decisions about the future of our country and we'll leave, we'll leave Ruth Davidson weeping in the opposition benches. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, can I declare an interest as a member of the GMB trade union? Um, the announcement earlier this week that Burnt Island Fabricators, known as Bifab, is possibly going into administration is deeply worrying news for communities in Fife, the Isle of Lewis and, of course, for the wider Scottish economy. Some of them are here today and such is their commitment that they've been working without pay to keep things going. And I hope the Deputy First Minister will join with me in welcoming them to Parliament. There are over a thousand skilled jobs at stake. This business is a key strategic player in Scotland's renewable energy sector and has built up a solid reputation thanks to its workforce for carrying out this type of work. We understand that Bifab are experiencing financial problems due to disputed contracts with Seaway Heavy Lifting. This is a Dutch company that has received significant public funding from the UK government for SSE's Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm development. What discussions has the Scottish Government had with Bifab, Seaway, SSE and the UK Government to keep the work and jobs in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, I welcome the issue that Jackie Bailey has raised. And I want to say, first of all, that the issue of Bifab is, yes, very important to the three communities that Jackie Bailey referenced, but it's important to the whole country. And it's important to our whole proposition on manufacturing and renewables. And I can't overstate the importance of the contribution the company makes. Um, I deeply admire the workforce for their skill, their capability and their capacity, but also for their tenacity in working through some very difficult and unnerving circumstances that all of the workforce are facing just now. I want to take this opportunity to reassure uh, Parliament uh, the workforce and the communities that the Scottish Government is doing ab absolutely everything we can to try to bring this matter to a resolution. Fundamentally, this is a private contractual dispute amongst players within the, uh, the consortium that are involved. And the Scottish Government has been talking to every party involved um, when this became clear last Thursday evening to us for the first time. And the, the Government has had an extensive relationship with Bifab over many years. Uh, myself, Mr Ewing, Mr Brown, Mr Wheelhouse over many years have met with the company, so we know it well. But on Thursday evening, this particular circumstance became clear to us. 
Um, uh, Keith Brown and Paul Wheelhouse were immersed in discussions with the trade unions, with BIFAB, with the uh, with SSE, with um, SHL uh, and with the United Kingdom Government. Yesterday the First Minister spoke from Bonn where she's attending the climate change talks to the leadership of SSE and also SHL and the First Minister is returning early from her trip in Bonn to be available this afternoon to convene face-to-face -face discussions at St Andrew's House if those are required. There is a further discussion taking place uh, very shortly during First Minister's question time which will give us some further information about progress that has been made. But I want to reassure Jackie Bailey that the Scottish Government is doing absolutely everything we can by convening discussions and by driving this process to ensure that we protect uh, BIFAB, we protect the employment of everybody involved in the three sites, and that we protect the enormous investment that's been made in building the skills to develop manufacturing and renewable energy capacity within Scotland. Jackie Bailey. Can I very much thank John Swinney both for the tone and content of his response and I hope it does reassure, reassure the thousands of workers whose jobs are at stake. The Scottish Government's energy strategy prioritises renewables. This is an industry where more work is expected and BIFAB should be at the forefront of delivering that infrastructure. That is one of the key reasons that the Scottish Government itself has interest in BIFAB through Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So can the Deputy First Minister tell Parliament what is the total value of the disputed contracts which led to these problems and has an impact assessment been carried out um, of the value of BIFAB to the wider community both in Fife and in the Isle of Lewis? The, the, the total value of the Butrix project is the best part of a billion pounds. So this is a colossal investment in the renewable energy sector. Not all, not all of that activity, of course, is taking place at BIFAB, but the, there are issues uh, within the contractual arrangements that are in dispute between the different parties. The government is actively involved in trying to resolve those disputed sums to try to reach a conclusion because that will create the pathway for uh, future stability and activity at BIFAB. Now, obviously, the, uh, the, the Scottish Government, through our agencies uh, at, uh, in the Highlands, HIE at Arnish, and through Scottish Enterprise at both Burnt Island and Methyl, have been heavily involved in supporting BIFAB in developing its capacity and its capability. And uh, the Government and our agencies are very prepared to continue to take forward discussions in that respect. Um, on the question of the economic analysis, the government obviously is involved with BIFAB because we recognise the economic significance of the organisation to the renewable sector. And Jackie Bailey very fairly makes reference to the fact that there are significant opportunities in the renewable energy sector into which BIFAB would be a fantastic contributor in that process. And for that reason, and that reason amongst any others, the government is determined to make sure we secure the future of BIFAB. Jackie Bailey. Um, can I welcome very much the return of the First Minister from Germany, where she's been talking about climate change, particularly as one of Scotland's biggest sources of renewable jobs is facing administration. So these benches will support the government in any way that we can to secure the jobs at risk at BIFAB and to keep the work in Scotland. It is essential that all options are explored and I'm encouraged by the Deputy First Minister's words and I'm sure that workers in Burnt Island, Arnish and Methyl will welcome that too. But what those workers need is a cast iron commitment, a commitment which will allow them to continue to work and prepare for future renewable work. Will the Deputy First Minister give them that commitment to providing financial support upfront if required so that the company can remain operational until the jobs are secured and the work remains in Scotland. Deputy First Minister. The presiding officer, uh, my ministerial colleagues, uh, Keith Brown and Paul Wheelhouse, have been um, keeping members of parliament in touch on this issue. Um, Keith Brown responded to uh, a topical question from my colleague, the local member, David Torrance, earlier on this week. And later on today, a briefing will be issued to members of the Scottish Parliament to advise colleagues of the progress that has been made in these discussions, and that should be available later on today. On the question of financial involvement and financial assistance, the government will, of course, um, stand ready to, in, to engage in any discussions on that question. Um, quite clearly, there are, uh, there are rules within which the government has got to operate in the, in the deploying of public expenditure. But our fundamental focus just now 
is on resolving the contractual issues that have led us to this situation. And I, uh, our, our energies are concentrated on that. That's why the First Minister is coming back early from Bonn. It's why she's been involved in dialogue. It's why uh, Keith Brown and Paul Wheelhouse have been involved in these discussions directly to try to resolve these questions. Uh, and of course, uh, the government will remain open to discussions about financial support, uh, should that be required. Um, but I, I want to close on one final point, and it is this. We are in the situation that we are in just now with the opportunity of a slightly longer time window to try to resolve this than we at first thought that we had because of the commitment and the dignity of the workforce of BIFAB. That is why we are where we are. And I thank every one of them who will be having a very uncertain time since this news broke on Thursday for demonstrating that tenacity, which is seen around the world as an illustration of the commitment of workers in this country to manufacturing, and we are very proud of all of them. And there's a number of constituency supplementaries. I imagine uh, the first on the same subject from David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, far to my question to Cabinet Secretary on Tuesday, can the Deputy First Minister guarantee that it will keep Parliament and the MSPs, local MSPs, um, updated on the, any discussions with by FAB in the future? And what message does he have to the members of the workforce who gathered outside Parliament today? Deputy First Minister. But, um, can I say to Mr Torrance that um, the Government will keep members of Parliament informed in the course of today. We will issue um, a briefing from relevant ministers later on this afternoon and of course issues will be communicated more widely um, if we have some further progress. Um, we, are, um, we are seeing some progress in those discussions with the relevant parties but we are not at a conclusion at this stage and I think we have some way to go before we can get to a conclusion that provides the workers with the assurance that they are quite understandably and quite rightly searching for. Um, and finally, President Officer, can I say to Mr Torrance that um, we very much value the contribution and the expertise of the workers at BIFAB. It's a key strength in our renewable energy sector and the Scottish Government is determined to do all that we can to protect their long-term future. Uh, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister will appreciate that Shetland's chronic pain service has been provided by two consultant anaesthetists. One left Shetland last week and the other will leave by Christmas. Uh, this will affect not just chronic pain uh, sufferers and patients, but also potentially uh, women waiting to deliver babies because of the need for anaesthetists with the necessary maternity skills. Will he, what will he now do to ensure that there is continuity of care for those who need it, and particularly the, the requisite skills in the maternity service? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Mr Scott raises a, a significant issue and obviously for the, 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 he raises an issue which is directly related to the continuity of important services that we would all want to see delivered um, uh, uh, in Shetland uh, and in an accessible way to members of the public. Um, obviously we will have discussions with NHS Shetland about these questions and, uh, and also the Health Secretary would be very happy to discuss the issue directly with Mr Scott to make sure that we can take all necessary steps to ensure that there is a continuity of service for members of the public um, who clearly uh, depend on that service in our remote island communities. Richard Lockhead. Today I'm meeting Ofcom to discuss the impact of parcel delivery charges on customers in Murray and the wider region, which as the first step of the First Minister can imagine is a, a growing issue at the forefront of people's minds in the run-up to the festive period as more and more people buy online. And is the Deputy First Minister aware that it's now cheaper, according to many of my constituents, to buy online from overseas companies than have things delivered from elsewhere in the UK? And there seems to be no rhyme or no reason for the wild variation in delivery charges. And even some Ellen-based companies, as we learned this week, are charging more to deliver to Elgin than Essex. And will the Deputy First Minister join me in urging consumers to shop around and name and shame those retailers that are fleecing northern and rural customers? And we'll discuss with his colleagues what more can be done to tackle this issue, which is costing rural Scotland millions of pounds in these ridiculous surcharges. And how can we put more pressure on the UK government, who, after all, have responsibility for regulating such issues? Deputy First Minister. Um, Presiding Officer, Richard Lockhead raises a very important issue, and I understand the significance of it for his constituents in uh, Murrayshire, but it will apply across a much wider geography in rural Scotland. 
Uh, I welcome the conversation he's having with Ofcom. That's mirrored by conversations the Scottish Government is having. And I reassure him that the Scottish Government will do all that we can to influence the discussion and the debate around these questions with the United Kingdom Government and also with Ofcom. Um, I certainly associate myself with his call to consumers uh, to set out their concerns about these issues because consumer opinion on these questions is very strong uh, and can be of enormous significance in changing the minds of individual companies who are not responding in a sympathetic and positive way to the issues that Mr Lockhead is raising, which should not be having to be raised because individuals in the country should be able to have access to these delivery services without being punished for the location in which they live. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It's already been acknowledged that the Deputy First Minister is answering questions today because the First Minister has been at the Climate Change Conference in Germany and Greens have been pushing for Scotland to follow the lead of countries like Sweden and set a target for net zero emissions. We believe that can be achieved by 2040. Any later than that would be a slower rate of improvement than Scotland has been achieving so far. So I welcome the statement that's apparently been made by the First Minister that the government would come to an early decision or when Scotland would aim to have net zero emissions. That implies it's a matter of when, not if. Is this now government policy, a goal of net zero emissions, and will a target date be made explicit in the new climate change bill? Deputy First Minister. So, so the first thing I, I want to say is to set out to Parliament the reaction that the First Minister has had to the commitments that have already been given by Scotland and the performance that we have already delivered on climate change. And the First Minister and I have spoken a number of times over the course of uh, the period in which she has been in Bonn, and she has been struck, uh, as was the Environment Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, who was there earlier on in the week, by the tremendous level of international respect for the leadership that Scotland has deployed, not just this government, but this parliament, which unanimously approved the climate change bill um, back in the first term of this government, uh, for the leadership that we have taken and for the inspiration that has deployed to other countries. So quite clearly, the government it wishes to maintain that position of leadership on the issue of climate change. Mr Harvey is absolutely correct that the First Minister said um, yesterday that we would be coming to an early decision on when we will aim to reach net zero emissions. Um, that is the issue that we are currently considering within government. And obviously how we take that forward will be set out to Parliament in due course and will obviously have a bearing on the commitments that are made in relation to the Climate Change Bill, which will be before Parliament shortly. Patrick Harvey. Well, it will certainly be for all political parties uh, to commit to ensure that a, a realistic date and an ambitious date for that target of net zero, zero emissions is set into legislation. But of course, if we're going to reach those kind of ambitious targets and make that progress, uh, it's very clear that one of the areas uh, that's inevitable is that it cannot be done without much more offshore wind and energy. So I, I welcome the comments that have been made uh, by the Deputy First Minister and others uh, about Bifab, a company that's been at the forefront of our transition away from fossil fuels and toward a renewable economy. The commitment shown by the workers that the Deputy First Minister has recognised needs to be repaid by us all, by this government, by the Westminster government and by the other companies involved. They deserve no less than that and it's important if we're going to retain the jobs this transition to a renewable future uh, offers for Scotland that we show that commitment. After all, if the Scottish Government can bail out an airport, surely we can show a level of commitment and investment to the renewable energy industries that will be critically important for our future. So how can the workforce at BIFAB have confidence that the Government's transition plan will involve urgent support for their jobs and the many others that can be generated and an industrial strategy that commits wholeheartedly to fossil fuel decommissioning and our renewable industries instead. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, I, I hope I've made clear to Parliament in my answers to Jackie Bailey and to David Torrance the absolute determination of the government to ensure there is a secure future for the, BIFAB, uh, for the three BIFAB sites across the country. And in so doing, that is us fulfilling the practical manifestation of our commitments on renewable energy. If this, gov this government has been criticised, actually, by many people for being so determined 
to pursue a renewable energy route. Others have challenged us in this Parliament, I'm looking at some of them over here, to take a different approach on energy policy, but we have been absolutely trenchant in our commitment to renewables, re renewable energy development. I make no apology for it. It is something of which I am one of the many things I am enormously proud about my association with this government for the last 10 years that we have managed to deliver. Now, Patrick Harvey fairly says that it's not all within our gift because there's obviously an interaction with UK energy policy and the, uh, the wider debate in that respect. And uh, we pursue that actively with the UK government. I was pleased when I met the Convention of the Highlands and Islands just recently at the news that had emerged from the UK government about some better opportunities for us to activate um, renewable energy in our island communities in the Western Isles in Orkney and Shetland. So we've, we're beginning to make some progress on having a framework in place that enables us to support wider renewable energy development. So I give uh, Mr Harvey the absolute assurance that renewables will be at the heart of the government's energy policy. And I think he should also take heart from the fact that in the programme for government, we made it absolutely crystal clear that transforming our approach on energy generation would be a central part of our industrial strategy, particularly in relation to the decarbonisation of transport um, over the course of the next 20 years and, uh, and within that period. And the government is determined to take forward that agenda. So I hope that reassures Mr Harvey of the continuity of policy that the government is determined to take forward. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Does the Deputy First Minister believe the presenter of a talk show legitimising RT Russia today would be a fit and proper person to own Scotland's oldest national newspaper? Deputy First Minister. Um, obviously, uh, one, of the things, one of the things I don't control <laughs> is the ownership of newspapers in our country. Or well, not yet, anyway, but uh, no doubt Mr. Mr Rennie is suspicious that I might at some stage find myself in that position. But I think what's important here is that um, the choices that... Uh, Alex Hammond has made a choice about the, uh, the platform for his television programme to be taken forward. Uh, the First Minister set out her perspective on this question. And I understand, although I've not seen it myself, that on uh, the programme that has been broadcast today, um, Mr Salmond had guests from both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party on his programme. So I suspect that reflects the, uh, the plurality of choice that will be in his guests that will be on his programme. Willie Rennie. I'm disappointed the first Deputy First Minister is seeking to make such a light topic of this matter. <laughs> News, newspaper regulation is devolved. It is devolved, so it's reasonable to ask whether Alex Salmond would be a fit and proper person to own the Scotsman when he has been paid by President Putin's propaganda channel. This, we should remember, this is the TV channel that seeks to undermine Western democracy and ignore human rights abuses at home. The historian ambassador told this very parliament this morning that Russia today is Kremlin-backed propaganda. So it should turn our stomach to know that a former First Minister of this country is giving it credibility and legitimacy by launching this show this very day. Scotland's, Scotland's reputation abroad has been damaged. Countries, small countries, particularly along the Russian border, will be deeply concerned by this decision. Alex Salmond does not speak for Scotland on this. So what is this government doing to actively distance themselves from Alex Salmond? Deputy First Minister. I, I thought that Willie Rennie might have checked up before he asked the question that he asked of me today. Because on the 23rd of September 2015, none other than Vince Cable appeared on Russia Today. So, I think it's important. The First Minister has set out that uh, if she had been asked uh, about what channel it was appropriate for this programme to be broadcast on, she would not have chosen 
Russia today. Uh, but this is an issue that Alex Salmon, who is not currently an elected politician, is free to take forward as he wishes. But I think what is also fair for me to say in all of this is the whole debate has been struck by a stinking reek of hypocrisy from every other political party on this question. And that, and that's, and that's perhaps the best way I can close my answer to this question. We have some additional supplementaries. The first from John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, two days ago, ScotRail issued this document. It's a, a launch of a voluntary lever scheme, and it's available to a range of positions within the organisation. I'm advised this is the third time since 2015 that they've sought to encourage people to leave, and this from an organisation that relies heavily on agency staff. I'm also told there's 256 vacancies in the cumulative uh, uh, worth of their salaries is £3 million per annum. Will you get the Scottish Government to intervene to ensure that these 256 posts are filled and ensure that it's public service rather than profit that drives Scotland's railways? Deputy First Minister. Um, the, the, the first thing I'd say to Mr Finney is that the, there are clear contractual obligations within the uh, Abellio contract that have to be fulfilled. And I think what's been clear from events in the, the course of the last few months, when this issue has been raised and been a significant topic of discussion, that the Transport Minister has assiduously pressed uh, Scott Rail Abellio to make sure that those contractual obligations are fulfilled and that the services to which the organisation were committed are delivered within Scotland. Now, what's important is that that um, monitoring and presence is sustained by the Transport Minister and I give Mr Finney the assurance that that will be the case. Obviously within the contract there is a commitment that, and an obligation that there should be no compulsory redundancies within that contract. That is a stipulation of the contract but clearly ScotRail Abellio will make judgments about the recruitment and deploying of their staff but that must be done within the context of fulfilling the contractual obligations signed up to by the organisation and I assure Mr Finney and Parliament the Government will make sure that is the case in all circumstances. And Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister will have seen the tragic story earlier this week of Libby Toledo, the 17-year-old young woman who took her own life following a life of struggle with severe mental health issues. Her mother powerfully made the, the point of her frustrations regarding the lack of residential secure psychiatric care for children in Scotland. Did the, the Scottish Government has now agreed in principle to create nine such secure beds. But will the Deputy First Minister take this opportunity to clarify when we will have these? And would the Deputy First Minister also agree with me that this seems to follow the weary pattern of missed opportunities, Libby having been identified as having ADHD and autistic spectrum disorder, but that neither of these were followed up by formal diagnosis or specific follow-up or support? Deputy First Minister. The first thing I want to say is that I understand uh, unreservedly the deep sorrow um, that is associated with the death of Libby Toledo and the, uh, the deep anguish this will cause to her family, given the struggles that quite clearly this uh, young woman has had in her life. It's not, Mr Johnson will understand that I can't go into an awful lot of detail about the case, but I do want to assure Parliament that there has been interaction with services over a sustained period of time. But that's of absolutely no comfort whatsoever to the family of Libby Toledo in the trauma that they are now having to come to terms with. So the government is committed to the creation of secure inpatient units. Um, though the work is underway uh, to take that forward. It will be housed by NHS Ayrshire and Arran. The, 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 the unit is at a relatively advanced stage in the planning process and we are working to complete that as quickly as is possible. So I give Mr Johnson the assurance that we recognise the significance of this issue, the necessity of these facilities to be created, and the very active work that is underway to make sure that happens as quickly as possible. And Graham Simpson. It's widely accepted that there's a skills shortage in the building industry and that the industry is sitting on a demographic time bomb. So I was concerned to hear that the Construction Industry Training Board is seeking a new operator of the National Construction College site in Inchinnan and will withdraw from the site once a new buyer is found. 
Can the Deputy First Minister say what steps the Scottish Government will take to ensure a seamless transition and how they plan to step up training in the sector? Deputy First Minister. The, 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 the Government clearly uh, recognises the importance of having the appropriate and adequate skills available to us in the construction sector. We will need that to make sure that the programme that's presided over by the Community Secretary in relation to house building over the course of this period in the public sector alone is able to be taken forward in addition to our wider infrastructure ambitions in this respect. So the work that we take forward in relation to the development of apprenticeships and the expansion of apprenticeships to 30,000 over the course of this parliamentary term is an important foundation of that commitment. Um, as is our commitment to the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda, which is about making sure we develop the skills that are required. In relation to the specific point about the CITB facility, the Government will obviously engage with the Construction Industry Training Board to ensure a seamless transition because it's in nobody's interest for there to be any disruption in this respect. But allow me, Presiding Officer, to also inject into this the fact that this week we saw our unemployment rate in Scotland at 4%, the equal lowest in the United Kingdom, equal with Northern Ireland, and lower than the unemployment rate in the rest of the United Kingdom. So we have a very strong position with a growth in employment in Scotland. So we have a, a very large proportion, an overwhelming proportion of our population are in employment. And we still have vacancies in uh, various aspects of the public sector, in the private sector, and we want to encourage the filling of those vacancies. I simply pose the question to Parliament, how on earth do we think that's going to be helped by turning off the tap of free movement of labour, which can help us to address these issues, which is the lunacy that the Conservative Party is associating us with? Question number five, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what representations the Scottish Government is making to the UK Government ahead of the autumn budget. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance wrote to the Chancellor on the 10th of November ahead of the forthcoming budget. The letter called on the Chancellor to recognise the serious challenges Scotland is facing as a result of Brexit and to bring forward sustainable measures to boost the economy. It also called on him to ease the pressure on the public sector and those who work in it. The Cabinet Secretary also urged the UK Government to reverse plans to impose a further £3.5 billion worth of cuts on Scotland and to pause the rollout of universal credit. In the meeting that the Prime Minister had this, this week with the, Prime, with the First Minister, uh, the First Minister reiterated the Scottish Government's long-standing opposition to the UK Government's austerity agenda. Bruce Crawford. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer and I welcome the representations made to the Chancellor ahead of the UK Budget next week. But turning specifically to the payment of VAT by our police and fire services. Now, I may be naive, First Minister, but I am hopeful that four years of consistent SNP campaigning on this issue will pay off. And at last, the Chancellor will give Scotland's police and fire services the same exemption from VAT as every other territorial force in Scotland. But does the First Minister agree with me that, in all fairness, the Treasury should also pay back the £140 million already paid. And does he also agree with me about the noises off to his left show that they are more concerned in standing up for their masters in London than defending public services in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. I think Mr Crawford makes a very strong point to Parliament today. <laughs> Uh, I, agree. I agree with Mr Crawford that the Treasury should hand back the £140 million already paid. We welcome the Prime Minister's commitment, which was given yesterday, to look at the issue of VAT paid by Scotland's emergency services. Police Scotland remains the only territorial police service in the United Kingdom unable to reclaim VAT it pays on goods and services, with the same inequality applying to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We have consistently pressed the UK Government over this disparity and we would urge them to finally bring this unfair situation to an end and do the right thing for Scotland's frontline emergency services. Yeah. Question number six, Rachel Hamilton. 
Presiding officer, may I declare an interest as a small business owner? To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take in light of reports that one in ten shops are lying empty and fewer people are visiting high streets. Deputy First Minister. It, the Government is taking forward a number of measures, principally through Scotland's Town Centre First Principle uh, and also the Town Centre Action Plan, to tackle key issues such as empty shops and to improve the vibrancy of our town centres. This year we've reduced the rates bills poundage by 3.7% and funded total rates relief of around, of around £660 million, including the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which will lift 100,000 properties out of rates altogether. We also plan to increase the incentive for occupation of empty properties through an expansion of our Fresh Starts rates relief from April of next year and have introduced powers for councils to further reduce rates in their areas. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer, but the SNP's large business supplement is double the UK rate. And despite its name, it doesn't only punish large businesses. Many struggling high street stores who already have to cope with reduced footfall are being hit by this additional rate when they are family-run local businesses. Will the, will the Deputy First Minister accept, as he did once in 2012, that the poundage rate should be, and I quote, no higher than that set in England to help attract and retain businesses. Deputy First Minister. As I set out in my original answer, the government has taken a sustained range of measures, particularly through the Small Business Bonus Scheme, to relieve many businesses in exactly the situation that uh, Rachel Hamilton raises on our high streets mm -hmm. from the burden of business rates. And as I go around the country, I've met many small businesses who um, are deeply appreciative of the fact that that commitment has been in place. So the government has, over the years, given consistent support to our small business community and our town centres, and we will continue to do so as we take forward our commitments to boost the Scottish economy. Question number seven, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Deputy First Minister, in light of it being alcohol awareness week, whether he will provide an update on what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce alcohol harm. Deputy First Minister. The Government's efforts to reduce alcohol harm will be significantly enhanced by yesterday's judgment from the Supreme yeah. Court, yeah. Yeah. which confirmed unanimously the legality of our minimum unit pricing policy in Scotland. We will implement minimum unit pricing as soon as is practical, and the Health Secretary will make a statement to Parliament on Tuesday in these, in these respects to tackle the high-strength, low-cost alcohol that is causing so much damage to our communities. Uh, we also have about 40 other measures in our alcohol framework. The framework has had an impact and we will be updating that framework shortly to take further measures to assist in this respect. Monica Lennon. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer and I join him in welcoming the Supreme Court's decision to approve the implementation of minimum unit pricing. Alcohol harm costs Scotland £3.6 billion each year and is ripping lives apart. Minimum, minimum unit pricing will help to reduce alcohol harm over the longer term. It is the right thing to do, and I congratulate the government for pursuing it. But minimum unit pricing on its own is not a panacea. Changing Scotland's relationship with alcohol and reducing harm will require a radical culture change. Will the Scottish Government consider initiating a national information campaign about the consumption of alcohol to proactively increase awareness of the Chief Medical Officer's updated guidelines on weekly alcohol intake? Deputy First Minister. Um, first of all, can I wholeheartedly welcome the comments that Monica Lynn has made in relation to the Supreme Court judgment. Um, I, I talked of my pride about the record of this government in my response to Patrick Harvey, I'm enormously proud of the tenacity of my ministerial colleagues who have led in this process. Um, and nothing to do with me, First Minister, Kenny McCaskill, Alec Neill, Shona Robertson, two Lords Advocate, our health and justice officials and many stakeholders who have absolutely led this and we appreciate the support of Parliament in getting us to the position. But there has been an enormous challenge to our agenda and I'm so delighted that this government and this parliament held its nerve and won the day at the Supreme yeah. Court this week. <laughs> Monica Lennon has a very close um, uh, and, and very personal uh, contribution to make to the debate on alcohol, and she talked about costs. And she knows better than all of us that costs are not just about monetary costs of the impact of alcohol in people's lives. So we will certainly give consideration to the suggestions that she makes in relation to a national information campaign. As I indicated in my original answer, 
uh, the, the alcohol framework will be uh, updated. Uh, Aileen Campbell will be leading on that process within the government and she'll be delighted to discuss the suggestions that Monica Lennon makes in this respect. And I accept the point that Monica Lennon has made, that minimum unit pricing will not be the panacea. There has to be a culture change in our society. But if we look back at the culture change that has taken place in the country in relation to the ban on smoking in public places, or the culture change that has taken since we entrenched equality between individuals within our society and the change that that has led to in our society, Scotland is a better country for being bold in these respects and I'm very proud of what this parliament has legislated for. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. And we turn now to members' business. We'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.